I'd like you to take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. If you'll have your Bible open there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I enjoy attempting, by God's grace, to give you some things from Scripture that I hope that you can repeat to others. And I count it a greater joy than you could ever imagine that I have the opportunity to try to influence your lives. That's what life is about. And then gathering this influence and using it for the Lord and for His glory. I want you to take good notes of things, write some things down, because somewhere along the line, you may wish to counsel with someone or to speak to someone that you love about things that need to be done, and the Lord may use this again and again. Of course, I'd encourage you to read the entire context here. Paul is writing this second letter to the church in Corinth. It's a church with lots of problems. I used to think, why do churches call themselves Corinth Baptist Church? You know, all the things that went on in the church. But churches do, and your home church may be Corinth Baptist and be, be glad that it is. There's a lot of wonderful things that come out of these letters Paul wrote to them. But the Bible says in the first chapter of 2 Corinthians, beginning with verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. He also, helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. If you're in the habit of marking things or making note of something, I want to talk to you about this expression, by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Somehow or another, I'd like to frame this little talk in the context of this terrible situation Paul found himself in. Notice I expressed it in verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. In other words, it was too much for us. From time to time... Even recently, I said to my wife, I don't think I can do this. She said, oh, yes, you can. God will help you by his grace. And I I just felt that I should argue with her. Oh, no, I can't. And she said, oh, yes, you can. The Lord has helped you, and he'll help you now. God will strengthen you. And I want you to know that sometimes in school and situations like this, it's not the school. I I have have enough wisdom to know that. It's not the school that's the difficulty. It's the school mixed in with everything else. I sort of think about the guy who's trying to balance all the plates at one time, you know. You ever seen that with a stick and he's got this one going, this one going, this one going, this one going, tries to keep them all going. Well, when you're in school and you're busy and you're trying to finish something, that's good practice for life because you're going to have a lot of that to do. Life was, I thought, complicated as a boy growing up in a home with a mother with the responsibility of raising four children by herself, leaning heavily upon me to take care of things and to share her burdens to enter into things where we could discuss things perhaps I wasn't quite prepared to discuss. 
But you know, when your life moves along, you get older, get your own wife, children, not just the things that happen to you collectively as a family, but individually to your children, and then grandchildren, and then the responsibility of other, other people that I love and love dearly, would do anything for. The personal conversations I had this morning with people who left on this trip were conversations not about, I'm grateful that you're going on the trip, but how's everything going to be while you're gone at home? Do you need anything there? This kind of thing. When you love, you can't help but express those things. And it gets spread out to lots of responsibility. I'm not singing the blues. I'm, I'm excited about it. I'm grateful to God for it. But I just want you to know that through life you keep adding variables. It's like a math problem with many variables and you keep adding more variables. Somewhere or another, you have to find what's keeping you going. What will see you through. Now, some of you are a bit perplexed now. And we always keep coming back as Christians to the grace of God, by the grace of God, by the grace of God. Look what he says here. He says, he identifies, he came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. Uh, we didn't have room for this. This is the last thing we needed. We couldn't make it. We considered our measure to cope a certain measure, but this went beyond that. We were pressed out of measure. We had more on us than we thought we could deal with, so much so that we said, this time, this is going to kill us. We're going to collapse under this. It's over now. God has a way of bringing us to our end. It's sort of like those drills you went through in school when you were in athletics and you said, I can't run one more sprint, but you did. I remember in the summertime, we were in as good a shape as we were in the fall when we started playing ball in high school. And I just thought, I can't do this again. And before long, you build up a certain stamina. Well, in this, in this race, it's not building up just physical ability. It's building up a greater reliance upon the Lord. And a greater reliance upon the Lord. And a greater reliance upon the Lord. How, how much can we trust God with? How far can we go with this? Well, we even despaired of life. We had an, the sentence of death in ourselves. In other words, the sentence already passed, just hadn't been executed yet, but it, it's done now. That we should not trust in ourselves, that's where it brought us, but in God, which raised the dead. And he repeats, who delivered us from so great a death. He delivered us from so great a death. Of course, Paul was stoned and left for dead. Many people believe he was dead and God raised him from the dead. I'm not going to argue that. But notice, he delivered, past, and doth deliver, present. That's a great verse, verse 10. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us and use your language skills a bit there and grammatical skills to get hold of that he delivered he delivers he will yet deliver and that's what we find to be true isn't it I'm so pleased that some of you who got a little distracted somewhere in your preparation got back on track that says volumes to me about your character and when I see you do that I was high on you to begin with, but I'm even higher now. Well, for whatever that means, what, what, uh, what is my being high on you? I'm just trying to encourage you to say, I admire the fact that you get back in it and stay at it and do what you're supposed to do. There's no admiration, there's no admiration anywhere for a quitter. Only miserable companionship. And misery loves company. It tries to gather all the company it can and share their miseries. You don't want that. God designed you for much better than that. No doubt about it. You also helping together by prayer for us. And I want to encourage you. 
Some of you are struggling, having a hard time. I, I want you to ask people to pray for you, who will pray for you. I, I know that I have thousands of people praying for me. I know that I do. And I want you to listen, please. How many people do you have praying for you? That may be connected in some measure with your intensity about praying for others. Why should we expect people to sincerely pray for us when we're not willing to pray for others? I remember as a boy, my grandson was in my study last night, late as we were working on some things. He wanted me to see a certain website that, about outdoor things, trying to distract me from getting something done, but it was a good righteous distraction. And uh, I remember showing him a plaque that I keep in my study, the most improved student, 1965, most improved student at Everett High School. I've said to you before, I have, I have a degree from Hiawassee College and from University of Tennessee, then went on to seminary, and finished some things there. But I don't have any of those in my office or study at home. Not that they're not meaningful, but I know when God touched my life and changed my life. I know when I decided by God's grace, I said by God's grace, I would attempt to do what God had given me to do. I know when that happened. And the Lord recognized that and he gathered the heart and influence of some people, especially Mr. Robert Davis, my high school principal, to lead the faculty of the high school to give me an award. And the award I received at an outing we went to one day in the middle of the day other people were there from other schools and I got the award for the most improved student and there it sits right behind my desk and the study there. But I haven't really ever told the whole story. But a big part of the whole story is that I was digging a hole for myself. And one of my encouragers, a man that I respected greatly, said to me as a young man, you're digging a hole for yourself so deeply that you will never get out of it. And I had that visual image given to me from his, from his words. You're digging a hole for yourself so deeply you'll never get out of it. That was before that change. And I thought about that. And I could see myself in some sort of a, a hole, sort of figuratively lost and it almost became like literally lost deep, 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 deep in a hole and there was no way out. And I was doing it to myself. I was a professing Christian. I really was a Christian. I was very careless as a Christian. I blamed it on the fact that I didn't have encouragement from other people. I blamed it on the fact that my friends were not church-going, God-honoring Christians. I even blamed it on my family. They had no interest at the time in the things of God. And God used people, a simple woman, a mother of friends who spoke to me about the direction of my life, Mr. Davis, others. Now, you know, I want to tell you something. I did not come into what I'm doing from within it. I didn't just stand up one day. I came way from the outside Far removed from this type of thing. Far removed from this type of thing. I'm not saying that's where you have to come from. But I came far removed from all of this, into this. This kind of Christian life, this kind of living. And so I had to take it step by step, either as a conviction or just compliance with someone, or really a conviction. And it is a conviction. As a matter of fact, I think it's the only thing that will truly stand. Everything else about my education, about my feelings about conservatism, and politically, everything, any idea to live a virtuous life, everything has come out of my faith in God. And the increasing knowledge I've had of the Lord and His Word. Now, I want to come back to this statement. People prayed for him. Paul acknowledged the human element in his spiritual recovery. 
I'd like for you to write that down. Paul acknowledged the human element in his spiritual recovery. And he said, you've prayed for me. I sat beside Jack Hiles one day for three and a half hours and discussed his ministry. We were at an airport in Nashville, Tennessee. He and I were on the same board, the board of the soul of the Lord. We were trying to decide who was going to be the next editor to the soul of the Lord. He was sitting right beside me. You ever heard the name Jack Hiles? Great man. Dr. Hiles reached over and put his arm around me and he said, Clarence, I want you to know something. I nearly died. What I've gone through has nearly killed me. And I knew some things he'd been through. And he said to me, you, you never took any stone at me. You never tried to hurt me. You never tried to influence anyone to hurt me. But he said to me, there were times when you could have done more than you did. And you didn't. And I said to him, Dr. Hiles, I'm sorry for that. I just had so much to deal with myself. I thought I won't, I won't get involved in his trouble too. Paul acknowledged here, I have made a spiritual recovery and there's a human element in this. I made up my mind that day that I wouldn't stand by, no matter I didn't take a hand against him, I would not stand by without trying to help people who were hurting. God used that in my life. I'll never forget that conversation. Now, how many of you, and, and not just, yes, yeah, so just sort of flippantly, but how many of you know that there's been some person God used to help you get where you ought to get spiritually? I mean, there's a human handprint on this thing. I mean, there's, there's someone God has used that way. Would you raise your hand? Then I want you to know something. We have responsibility. to help other people like we've been helped. You want to know why I walk through the hallways trying to speak to everybody and say, hello, hey, how you doing? Thinking about this, that, or the other, asking questions, trying to take a part in your life. You know why? For this very reason. God put me here. I would not be here this moment doing this if God hadn't used other people to encourage me. You know what you have to do? You have to get your mind off yourself. You can't live for yourself. You can't live for how you look or what people think about you. It has to become so Godward, constantly improving on that so that it can be manward what it ought to be. If it's only manward, and some of you are digging a deep hole for yourself. Matter of fact, people of influence already think you don't have any. That's sad, isn't it? Now, I want to be the last person to give up on you. Lester Roloff used to say, he worked with people, you know, who were erring. Lester Roloff said, I'm not going to give up on anybody until I've been dead four days because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, you know, after that. That was just his way of saying it. But I want to be the last person to give up on you. But you be careful because you'll dig a hole. You see, the real Christian you are is the true Christian you are in the eyes of the people who know you the best. If I, if I didn't have Christian influence with my wife, who knows me better than any human being on earth, if I didn't have real Christian influence with her, I'd find it hard to live. Matter of fact, I think everything else would collapse. I want the opportunity. I beg God for the opportunity to help you, to make a difference in your life. And the Lord has used so many of you to make a difference in my life. That's what his work is all about. So, he says, thank you for your prayers. For the gift that you show, stowed, bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. In other words, 
You see, what these people did for Paul enabled Paul to help other people who had no idea where the help from these people came, but they'll be rejoicing someday because they said, the reason we got help is because you helped that person. And the reason somebody will have someday say, boy, I got the greatest wife, my kids got the greatest mother in the world is because we had a party sharing in that person's life. You understand how it works? And then he goes on to say, but our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience. He's going right down to the, you know, right down as deeply as you can go here. This is the way it is. And in simplicity and godly sincerity. Not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. God enabled all this. We've had our conversation. That's a wonderful word. It means our manner of life, the way we've lived. We've lived the way we've lived. In the world and more abundantly to you word. All this has been made possible by the grace of God. There are three, three legs that stands on. And I'll say this and we're finished, okay? I'll try to do it without comment. One is scripture. Is it biblical? Your children are wayward. The church is off track. A young person comes to you and says, I'm a girl, I think I should marry a girl. I'm a boy, I, should think, I think I should marry a boy. Um, whatever. Well, you know, you have a lot of sympathy. You love this person. You want to show kindness to people. You want to be the last to reject. But look, is it scriptural? The war is not with you, and the war is not with society. The war is with God. Is this what God wants? Is this God's way? And I don't think that you can twist God around and get him to change his mind from what he's clearly stated in his word. So that's one way, okay? Second thing is simplicity. That means singleness, singleness. You can't do, you can't do, I want you to look at me please, you can't do a thousand things at one time. You can't do 10 things at one time. I am a father, uh, a husband, a pastor, supposedly the founder and president of this school, but I can't do 10 things at one time. I can do one thing that will enable me to do all other things. The one thing, the one thing, the single thing is taking care of where I am with the Lord. And that will help me to do the 100 other things or the 10 other things or the three other things. But if I start trying to do all the other things, you know, it's about simplicity, singleness. How are you with God today? It's going to be tragic, some of you beautiful girls inside and out, you know, pleasant, happy, fun-loving. Marry some baggage that you have to drag around the rest of your life. But you're going to do that. You're going to do that if you don't take care of your personal walk with God. But if you take care of your personal walk with God, you'll deal with that. And men, you're going to do the same thing. Okay? So, simplicity. And then the third is godly sincerity. Simplicity and godly sincerity. That is, it's always sincere toward God. Godly sincerity. You can tell that in the way people speak, the way they deal with people. I want to rush through life. That's my, that's my tendency. I want to rush through life. Not to get in a hurry to get to heaven, but I just want to get everything done and get done. You know, I'm the type of guy, if you went to Disney World, I want to go to all the parks and see all the things and, you know. But when I'm finished, I, I, I want to have spent some time doing something I enjoyed. Well, Godly sincerity is recognizing that it's not something we're, listen please, God help me with this right now. Holy Spirit help me right now. Help me and give understanding to these hearers. Godly sincerity 
is not trying to achieve something that we keep hoping will happen. It's enjoying it all the time because it's, you already have it. You already have it. In other words, if Evelyn and I said, one of these days we're going to get where we can really enjoy our marriage and home and family, then we just keep trying to get to that. No, no, no. We already have it. We already have it. We enjoy it now. It's just like you say, well, when I can get out of here and praise God, when I get out of here and I'm not in a dorm and I'm not doing this and I'm going to get in the ministry and I'm going to have my own and I'm going to do, wait a minute. Is that the only time you're going to be happy? And I want you to know, when you get there, you won't be happy either because you didn't learn to live in godly sincerity each moment all the way through. It's not about, I mean, is heaven all I have? Am I just supposed to be miserable as a, a wretch until I finally get to heaven and see Jesus? No, God never intended that way. I'm to be enjoying the Lord and walking with the Lord now. Now. Whatever juncture you are, whatever stage you're in, whatever developmental part you are spiritually and emotionally and physically, you enjoy the Lord and have godly sincerity there. It's like this. Spurgeon laid down to die after 37 and a half years as the minister of Metropolitan Tabernacle. And as a, as a man only 57 years old, and he said to his wife, who was an invalid, who happened to be with him when he died in Menton, France, but she never got to go when he went there for those retreats, but she happened to be there. And his secretary, male secretary, was there. And um, William Joseph Harrell. And uh, Joseph William Harrell. And so he, he said to his wife, Jesus and I have had such wonderful times together. In other words, he didn't say, I'm really about to cross over now, honey. Susie, I'm about to cross over and I want you to know I'm looking forward to having to see the Lord and have the Lord and meet the Lord and be with the Lord. No, no. He said all through, Jesus and I have had such wonderful times together. And I'm saying to you, you say, well, when I came as a freshman, oh, I went through some struggles. Now I'm, and I went through some struggles, but but boy, I've had a great run. I've had a great run. It's been a great trip. And when you're 30 or 40, boy, I've had a great run. It's been a great trip. Boy, I've had a great run. It's been a great trip. You know? And then to discover, and really, the best is yet to come, but it's been absolutely wonderful all the way through. Let me tell you, if you have any love for me and what I'm doing and what I'm trying to do in my life, let me tell you what's important to me as far as organizational things. I want to keep the Lord right in the right place in my life. But this thing of Baptist, this Baptist friends trying to bring people of like mind together around truth and friendship and world evangelism is something I am passionate about. Passionate about. And it's for you. It's for you and for your generation. Finding pastors who have interest, mutual interest, and trying to bring them together. You know, that is, that is something I'm passionate about. Somebody who will get a burden and then bring those burdened people together to evangelize the small towns in America. How many of you come from a small town? I'd like for people to get a burden for small towns in America and bring those people together. That's something I have a passion about. How many of you came from a big town? Big city. You know, this capital city campaign and big cities, that's something I have passion about, to bring people together who they think, that's my, that's my thing. The 50 million Hispanic people in America. I don't like the idea that churches have Spanish ministries and stick people over in a ministry somewhere and, and never let them out of their hole. I think they'll be integrated into the church ministry, the whole church, just like when the language skills are available, just like You'd expect people to be integrated in, into America. That's something I have passion about. And, and I'd like to find people who have passion about that. 
And on I could go. Great music, youth ministry. I'm not controlling young people's lives. I'm not interested in controlling anybody's life. But helping them have the tools to make the right decisions and become the people God designed for them to be. And guiding them to the Lord. You can't drag them to God. That's something I have passion about. And this Baptist Friends is a, is a way for me to try to bring youth leaders who have that same passion together. Teaching and preaching the Bible. Not everything about the Bible, but the Bible. That's something I have passion about. Evangelizing the world. And there are people that God gives burdens to about certain parts of the world to bring those people together as Baptist friends around truth, friendship, world evangelism. That's something I have passion about. To treat people the way the Lord Jesus would treat them. That's something I have passion about. And... Uh, you're here in school, but this is the time you're here. I want you to help me do this. I want you to help me do this. And I want to help you do it. That's what it's all about. I want to leave you something. My poor old daddy had a 1956 Oldsmobile. He says, son, it's the only thing I got in the world that I own. Don't know anything on it. And that's why I'm going to leave you when I die. He died in 1963, had a 56 Oldsmobile. While he was in the hospital last time, somebody stole his Oldsmobile. <laughs> he never stopped apologizing for me, but he didn't have a car to leave me. Last time I saw him, he said, I've got nothing. Nothing. Would you like to have my leather wallet? It's got nothing in it. He took off his wedding ring. He said, would you like to have this wedding ring? I still wear it, even though your mother and I have been divorced. Would you like to have it? I got his wedding ring. I want to leave you something. And it's not money. It's not buildings. It's not even a school. I want to leave you with the thought, I'm going to have a heart, you, you're going to have a heart for God. And you're going to live your life scripturally with this single thing I'm going to do to walk with the Lord. And I'm going to enjoy where I am now and not try to kill everybody in the world but to be a real witness for the Lord. The only way you can do that is by the grace of God. I'll see you, many of you, tonight I guess and then hope all of you in the morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. Jesus, thank you for letting us start this school and for after all these years, these dear ones coming. Do a mighty work. Help us not to lose any of them. For you, I thank thee, Lord, for the precious treasure they are. Help us to help one another. Pray for one another. In Jesus' name, amen.